see people wearing t-shirts uh, upset about the loss of the library of, of Alexandria you know if only we could find out what happened to it its mysteries and its books and so forth but I'm gonna, what I'm going to offer you today is I'm going to give you way too much in the way of details <laughs> okay so you may be overwhelmed by how much information we do have on this library. I will cite sources if you want me to, and I, I do that anyway, uh, because that's I'm a historian at heart, I well, am yeah, in reality too. But the point of the matter is, uh, after you finish uh, listening to this talk, you're not gonna only know about what happened to the library of Alexandria, you're gonna know uh, specifically the names of the librarians, who was there, how they did things, right down to the smallest details. Does that interest you at all? Is that what you're here for? So uh, we will solve this mystery. Uh, uh, we will start off with an overview on Alexandria, which was founded by Alexander the Great in 331. Uh, but uh, obviously at first, it was a small city. It was a new town. And uh, most of the people who were living there were soldiers. Uh, and um, uh, merchants <laughs> and mercenaries uh, and those who kind of collected around these new towns, high degree of prostitution, yada, yada. Okay, the point of the matter is it's a small town and it's a new town. Now nowadays we think of a new town and we think of, ooh, this is exciting because we're so entrenched in the idea of progressivism and what is modern is best and wonderful. But in the ancient world, they're all about tradition. The older the city is, the deeper the legacy, the better. And if that city doesn't have a great legacy, you just simply invent it. <laughs> Don't make that up. You know, you know who develop deep roots because that matters. And each of these cities uh, oftentimes talked about uh, not only their great legacies, but what they're known for. Obviously, when you think of Athens, you think of what? Philosophy, right? Also Athena. Uh, city of Ephesus, the greatest Artemis of the Ephesians, and so forth and so on. But every city has their something that is special. And here comes Alexandria. And what does it have that is special? It's sitting there in a virtual march. <laughs> it's a brand new town full of soldiers and merchants and, and arriving artisans, what, what good is it? What can they contribute? And they really didn't have much. So they looked around and they said, you know what we have? We've got lots of weeds. <laughs> we have lots of reeds. Okay, so you see uh, where we're going with this, right? So we have, they have what's called the papyrus plant. It's everywhere. It's like I said, it's, it's all along Alexandria. And that is the component to make paper. There's plenty of this raw resource growing everywhere. 
So Alexandria, before there's ever even a library, already gets involved in book production, in making books, in shipping out books. This has to be understood. And oftentimes, this is not talked about. And it's so easy to make. Uh, these books, uh, basically, uh, well, what you do is you take the papyrus plant and you find the outer rind and you remove it. And then you have the pith of the plant. And what you do is you cut the pith uh, into long strips. Yeah, usually like four strips. And then you lay these together. It's all sticky and you kind of overlap them a little bit. And then what you do is you then find another pit, cut them into strips, and then lay them at a right angle across the other one. And then you get a nice hammer and you beat it down, right? And you put some glue in the mix and then you smooth it over with a stone or a shell and then you dry it out. And ladies and gentlemen, you've got paper. <laughs> well, that was hard. It wasn't difficult to make. We can make a lot of this <laughs> uh, in abundance. And guess what? The materials are free. <laughs> it's everywhere to be found. It's, so Alexandria found its thing. You know, we have books. So what else can we do? Well, then of course, um, you, here comes uh, a monarch is the, what happens. I'm not gonna talk about Alexander the Great. He's great and everything else, but you know, he dies in, in Babylon and body is brought to Alexandria. It looks like I'm talking about it, but I'm not supposed to be talking about it. Anyway, there's division and there's fighting. Uh, and eventually, yeah, the Adelids taken over uh, certain areas. You have the Seleucid, the capital of Antioch, taken over certain areas. Well, the area around Alexandria it fell under the Ptolemies, all these warring generals. So Ptolemy the first takes control. Uh, over uh, Alexandria, and I'm so happy I said that within like two and a half minutes because usually it takes me 10 minutes to get through all that. And what happens is that uh, uh, he wants to really buttress this idea of this new product being important, but also he wants to use these books in connection to the accumulation of knowledge. Ptolemy the first is a historian by nature. In fact, he wrote a history of Alexander the Great. So naturally, he is interested uh, in this kind of topic. But, um, so what he does is that he wants to have a think tank. He wants to gather together some of the best minds to be inside of his palace and to think and talk about things and strategies, you know, how to, you know, fight our enemies, usually the Sorry, the Seleucids. Uh, anyway, you know, and uh, so what happens is we got to have something here for this particular think tank. And we need to have inspiration. Well, who inspires us? Well, in a metaphysical sense, who inspires us is the muses. That's right. Amusing, I know. Always amusing. Anyway, so what will happen is the dedication, the special wing that's added onto the palace will become known as a, it's dedicated to the muses, a museum. Ah, now you're getting that. Ah, so it's a museum now. Well, wonderful. So now we have a museum. You know, a museum is not much without scholars. <laughs> you, know, you know, you gotta have, you gotta think tank, you gotta have thinkers. Well, how in the world are you gonna do this? I gotta tell you something, scholars have not changed <laughs> since that time. How do you lure a scholar uh, to come to Alexandria? Free lodging. <laughs> Free food. <laughs> That's right. He advertised, if you come and you move to the library of Alexandria, you can stay however long as you like. Oh, sorry, it's called the museum at this time. You can stay however long as you like but under certain conditions. Uh, first of all, you have to absolutely um, have students. <laughs> at least at least one, they say, but you could have more, you know? So at least students, you also have to talk to one another. So they make it mandatory for you to sit around and have dinner together at least once a day. Now, obviously, I'm sure they have some days off because that would be pretty, 
obnoxious after a while. But these uh, dinners were like uh, based upon the symposium. And so they went well into the night, which brings up something else. And that is these scholars were allowed to have as much alcohol as they want. And as we know from Athenaeus and his hypnosophists, uh, we know that they, they had all different kinds of vintages that they enjoyed there and tried to experiment with. Oh, look, I gave a source. Uh, the point of the matter is, is yes, uh, to make a scholar happy, free food, free lodging, and they can get as drunk as hell any time they want. And as long as they have, of course, some students and talk to one another. No, well, guess what? The idea worked. <laughs> Scholars came in droves uh, to the museum. Of course, it's the old saying, if you build it, it will, it will come. So he had to really make it nice. So he created a wonderful portico with what's called etceteras, et cetera, et cetera. What's an et cetera? An et cetera uh, is like a little mini odium. Okay, <laughs> nothing clear there either. Uh, it's a little uh, area where there's steps that are circular that go into the walkway a little ways. And he built that along the colonnade. So the idea is uh, there's, of course, a covered colonnade. So you're sitting there, uh, maybe having a nice lunch and maybe had a bit of wine, and you're walking with your students and you want to talk about something. And so you, you know, you're walking along this uh, shaded colonnade, you get to one of those et cetera's, you have them sit around this mini circle there, and then you pontificate and talk all about wonderful things that are on your mind and do some question and answering and so forth uh, and debates, and there it is. And so it was facilitated with this in architectural sense. And there were also various rooms and chambers, and they started to fill them up with, guess what? One thing I didn't mention that scholars love. <laughs> so they started filling these chambers with books. And so the museum evolved into the Library of Alexandria. Does that make sense? It's a gradual, what they would call museum and library. Uh, and they would use, it it's means the same thing. The problem is, you have some scholars that say the museum is separate from the library. That's absolutely ridiculous because they sometimes use the same word in the same sentence. <laughs> no, it's the same. <laughs> They're one and the same. But this, this particular museum, which includes a library that keeps growing, is built inside the palace. This particular one. I want you to remember that. The first one is in the palace because we're going to go somewhere else with this. Uh, in a few moments. Yes, there's another one. Um, and so we move along. Okay, so we go through this. Oh, wow. Okay, so they're going to figure out who's going to be the librarian. Well, one of my favorite cities is Ephesus, and guess what? They picked the first librarian to be in charge of the Library of Alexandria from the city of Ephesus. Uh, so that's wonderful. Uh, and um, his name is Xenodos, Xenodos of Ephesus, and he becomes the director they call him the Bibliophilix, which simply means the guardian of the books. Uh, he's described by the 10th century Suda uh, as the director of the libraries uh, in Alexandria, plural. Although the Suda is later, uh, it seems to be, we'll, we'll find out, we'll find supporting evidence about these libraries earlier on. So we'll go through that. And he was born and raised uh, in the city of Ephesus. And he was given a very strict education before he went to Alexandria. Uh, who taught him? His name is Philetus of Pos. I'm going to mention him because we'll hear his name again. Philetus of Pos, uh, uh, he was both a scholar and a poet. Uh, and uh, he was very meticulous about word usage. Uh, and he drove him crazy as people using arguments with unsubstantiated evidence. He went crazy over this and he brought that mindset to his pupil, Xenodos. In fact, he, it drove him so crazy that at one, well, he, only one point, he actually starved himself to death <laughs> out of anger of these people who are not using evidence correctly. And he wasn't even satisfied with that. Boletus actually had on his epitaph the following, stranger, I am Philetius, 
the lying word and night evenings carrying destroyed me. Unquote. So the guy put it on his tombstone so that he can stand people who made undocumented claims. So that ethos then gets translated over to Zenodos of Ephesus. Can you imagine what kind of librarian this man will be? Extremely meticulous. In fact, he still influences us today. Zenodos. So here we go. So uh, so, but before we go on, uh, now they have to, Zenodos is involved in arranging how in the world do we get more books? <laughs> You're gonna love this. So they 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 send their agents out uh, throughout uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, all armed with lots of coin, and uh, they arrive at various ports, and they say, "Okay, we would like to make copies of your books." Okay. Now that seems reasonable. And so what will happen is that uh, they will be invited in some cases uh, to their local library or place to have archives. And the Alexandrians will copy off the text and then take that text back to Alexandria. But the Alexandrians uh, sometimes are a little bit mischievous because sometimes what they will do is they will take the original and leave them the copy because <laughs> they want the they want the oldest version. And uh, so, so, so what happens is is that uh, there's stories of them chasing them, saying, "Hey, you left us with a cheap copy." <laughs> you know, it's like, well, you know, uh, these things, these things, these things, things happen. But uh, in other cases, uh, the 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 uh, these librarians or these people who are seeking after these documents will have some soldiers with them and they will actually seize the documents and take them back to Alexandria. But good news, they still have some ethics. After making a copy, they'll give a copy back, they'll sail back with the copy version for the original city. <laughs> so, so, so there you have it. So eventually uh, uh, these will start to accumulate. I love the story where in Athens, uh, uh, the, the Alexandrians uh, with their agents, they arrived in, in Athens and they wanted to get copies of, of Sophocles uh, and, as well as other playwrights. They wanted to have the original ones. And the, the Athenians said, okay, we'll let you take them back to Alexandria, but you have to give us what is the equivalent of a million dollars as a deposit. And then for you to return it. So later on, uh, these agents return back to uh, Athens with cheap copies. And the Athenians are all, wait, wait, <laughs> we had a million dollar deposit. Well, we'll go ahead and give you the million then. Because <laughs> we always wanted the originals. So there you have it. So as you can imagine, uh, these copies uh, start to accumulate uh, quite a bit uh, during this period of time. There's so much emphasis on the originals. Now, what's going to happen is, is Zenodus uh, is, as, as, I, as I told you before, he's very meticulous. And so he decides that the library needs to be organized according to categories. So he put together a section for philosophy, a section for science, a section for medicine, as well as other categories. Then he had another idea. He says, okay. He said, with each roll, at the end of the roll, we will have a tab. And on that tab, we will have the author's name and the ethnic, or where he is from. Like Zenodus of Ephesus is from, well, you know, so the ethnic. And then, of course, um, at the same time, uh, there will be some distinction if people have the you know, same name and are from the same place. So if there's more than one copy of that document, then there will be also an addition of where they got it from, the provenance. So it will say from this town they got it or from that town. They, pretty, pretty meticulous. Good, good, good job, right? And then he said, okay, now what we're going to do uh, is that um, 
we got to categorize this in also another kind of order. So let's see, um, what should we do? Oh, I get it. We're going to put it alphabetically. He's the first one to do so. And so the library was then organized first time in world civilization in alphabetical order. Now, given that uh, it was only using the first letter only, and after that, so there's still kind of some loosey-goosey stuff going on, but by the second century CE, wait, second century CE, uh-huh, they decided to use the second and third letter to determine. Wait, that means the books are still around? That means the books are still around. <laughs> uh, okay, so much of the Julius series. Caesar story, which we'll be talking about a little bit. Uh, is this interesting? Right, so there you have it. So now this is the beginning. We still use this kind of idea today uh, in categorization. Of course, each role is called a book. Sometimes um, uh, for a work, it includes several, like 24 for the Iliad, uh, books which are just roles. What designates how long a role should be, how long it should be until it starts to tear. <laughs> Hey, look, it should be as long as it should be, but uh, oftentimes it's like, okay, yeah, we're going to shorten it up because uh, we're really going to unroll all these and, you know, see where they are. And the shorter the rolls, the easier it is uh, to find the materials. Okay, so there you have it. So that's, that's that. Now, well, who's going to be attracted? Let's, let's get some names here. You guys ever heard of Euclid? That's right. He's one of the first scholars to show up with a hungry belly and ready for wine. That's right. The, the, the so-called father of geometry, although the idea existed long after that, before that, he's the one who really created a definitive work on uh, geometry that would last through the ages. Where did this happen? This did happen at the Library of Alexandria. Uh, and so uh, even uh, Pappus, Notes that Polyanus of Rhodes uh, talked about this and how Euclid spent so much time there as long as, along with his um, uh, students, where he thus, quote, acquired such a scientific habit of thought. Uh, Euclid's greatest achievement, of course, is creating the standard text on geometry that is so well written and so logically organized that is still a standard to this day. His proofs are easy to use and apply, enabling one to gain a mastery of geometry in a short period of time. Uh, after Ptolemy I had read Euclid's The Elements, he wondered if there was an easier way to grasp geometry. Uh, Euclid replied, there is no royal route. <laughs> you just have to, you know, it's not always easy. Yeah, this work was so popular uh, throughout the ages that uh, here's a little bit of trivia you don't know, my father, as a very famous Lincoln scholar, uh, and he did a study of Abraham Lincoln's favorite books. Abraham's favorite books are as follows. Number one, the Bible. Number two, the collective works of William Shakespeare. And number three, Euclid and his geometry. He carried it with him all the time. In fact, there are studies now going about that the way he thought and organized himself when it came to uh, the Civil War and various strategies was using Euclidean means of geometry, <laughs> divide and conquer, so to speak. But anyway, moving right along, a little fun bit of trivia there. So Euclid, well, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, okay, so is there anybody else uh, that arrived uh, uh, at this time? Well, yes, uh, Strato, S-P-R-A-T-O. Um, he, he believed, and now he's here hanging out there, he believed that all material objects consist of particles. What? All material, all material is made out of particles. And we can't see it with the naked eye. And he's the one who advanced the idea of the atom in a theoretical sense. And he pushed this idea. And of course, this idea becomes very popular later on. Uh, uh, with various groups, uh, including uh, the Epicureans and the Stoics and so on and so forth. But I'm just throwing this one out here. He also said that everything in the universe is a combination of matter and energy. 
He also said there's a divine force is resident in nature and contains the principles of birth, increase, decay, and that is God, and that's within nature. He says all these atoms connect to everything else, and there's different atoms for different things. Is this fascinating? And they operate in different ways? He's purely theoretical. Where does he come up with these ideas? Guess where? The library of Along with Euclid. Okay, you're thinking, okay, so maybe this museum, this, this library is influential. We're not even to the best part yet. Okay, so we keep on going. Um, how many people heard of Herophilus? Herophilus, uh, 335 to 280. He arrived at the museum, once again, attracted to uh, its advertisement. Uh, he trained at the famous uh, medical island of Kos. Uh, which, of course, was established by Hippocrates. But what he did uh, was considered unethical in other places, but he thought, you got to do it. He's the one who was the first one to bring human cadavers and to dissect them for medical reasons, to figure out how the body operated. He's the first one. This is the beginning. And the Library of Alexandria, as opposed to costs, gave him the ability and the freedom to do so. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, there's a whole lot uh, when it comes to Greek thought and dissecting bodies, and most of it's not very good. But Alexandria, yeah, you know, for science. So what did he do? He distinguished between nerves and blood vessels. He tracked them throughout the body, and he charted them. Uh, he is the one who said, you know what? The heart doesn't decide anything. It's the brain. It's this mushy thing in our head that decides things. This is what works. But other things that he did, which were important, and by the way, he wrote, wrote this all down in nine books that were deposited in the library. Uh, what he did is he's the one who studied the female reproductive system. He's the one who discovered the ovum. He's the one who today, if you take a look, at various medical charts of the female parts, he's the one who named them. Don't take your gynecologist, don't tell him this. Anyway, moving right along. Uh, at the same time, he is also the one who cut through the eye, and he's the one who dissected the eye. He identified the cornea, the retina, the iris, the choroid, and he's also the one who gave us those names and and showed how that worked this is pretty amazing stuff this is the library of alexandria and he lived from 335 to 280 so he's he's the first one there and he's given the latitude to do his various experiments okay okay and of course um he also had some interesting uh ideas when it comes to life he maintained that a healthy life was eating well and getting plenty of exercise I, obviously this is not true <laughs> oh wait <laughs> he says when health is absent wisdom cannot reveal itself art cannot become manifest strength cannot be exerted wealth is useless and reason is powerless unquote there he is all right okay we're only through the first director <laughs> at my time making sure okay so we keep on going uh you guys ready for more it's not even the best part yet all right, here we go. The next king of, uh, of Egypt was Ptolemy II, uh, 282 to 246, who was very much interested in zoology. Yeah, he loved zoology. So much so that he decided to create a zoo next to the museum so they could study the various animals. Uh, so, so there's exotic animals here. Uh, which had never been seen before, were objects of amazement, according to Diodora Siculus. Um, they had different kinds of animals there. Isidora Sevea uh, notes that uh, this is where uh, they called certain uh, snakes boas, uh, because they killed cattle and oxen by entwining themselves around the udders and sucking them dry. Uh, we have, of course, uh, Pliny uh, the Younger also mentioning this fact. Uh, so when you think of uh, snakes, boa, 
that name. A lot of names for various animals start coming about at the Library of Alexandria as they're collecting them. Uh, he also decided to have a great procession of these animals. Uh, so he had um, uh, every once a year, so he had them preside out of the museum. Elephants, antelopes, heart of beasts, ostriches, zebras, wild asses. He had parrots, peacocks, and pheasants. Uh, he, the, the whole um, uh, parade ended with a white bear, leopards, caracals, and of course, a rhinoceros and a giraffe. <laughs> so that was at his museum, uh, the museum that's connected uh, to this Library of Alexandria and the study of zoology then uh, became very important at this time. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for that. Okay, so at this time uh, we have now the Iliad uh, and the Odyssey. They had many different versions of it. And Ptolemy II wanted one version. And so Xenodus of Ephesus, who is still there at this time, he, he lasted a long time. Uh, he says, what are we gonna do about this? And so what happened is they put together the definitive version of the Iliad and the Odyssey, which we use to this day. It took all the various versions. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So, and they start doing this later on with other great Greek uh, literature. Uh, we'll go through what those are when we get to them. Yeah, they start to go, we need to have one version uh, because there's too many multiple versions. Uh, and of course, they're the ones who said, okay, we need to have it divided into precisely 24 books. If you know your Iliad and Odyssey uh, history, Iliad, you'll see that there's some artificial means to make it into 24, just kind of fun little things thrown in for good measure. Something else happened during this time under Ptolemy II that is so important for history. And that is, uh, as they're going through and editing the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, these are the holy works of the ancient Greeks. There's a large Jewish population in Alexandria at this time. So it was a decision of Ptolemy II to do the same thing, translating the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, into Greek, which is called the Septuagint. Happened here. We know that. Uh, Ptolemy II. Uh, of course, the, the Babylon Talmud records King Ptolemy once gathered 72 elders. He placed them into 72 chambers, each of them in a separate one, without revealing to them why they were summoned. He entered each one's room and said, write for me the Torah of Moses, your teacher. God put it in the heart of each one to translate identically all the others as they did. And so supposedly uh, they left, they came all back together out of their 72 rooms and all the texts magically matched. <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> the Septuagint is inspired. And so it was. The Septuagint, its translation is the basis of the New Testament. There's only a few quotations that come from any other place, but the New Testament is quoting from uh, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, in most cases, it is from the Septuagint, not the Hebrew translation or the Aramaic. There are, there are three exceptions. Other than that, that's it. But see, the problem is, or the good news, I don't know depending on your perspective, is when you translate something from Hebrew into specific Greek, which has lots of words, you're going to add things to it. And a lot of the philosophical nuances fell into the text of the Septuagint that gets into the New Testament, and then it's understood by the early church fathers. That's why a lot of them are Platonists. Anyway, fun stuff, maybe learning too much, but there you have it. So this is very important when it comes to the studies of early Christianity, as well as Hellenistic Judaism. And once again, uh, in the Library of Alexandria, and you're thinking, wait a minute, yes, Epiphanius, uh, notes in 392. And so the scriptures, when they have been translated to the Greek language, were placed in the first library, which is built in the Bruchon, as I've already said. And there arose an addition to this library, a second one in the Serapium called its daughter. Anyway, there you have it. <laughs> so yes, we know it's there. <laughs> is this good? You guys having fun yet? 
All right. And the fun hasn't stopped. So moving right along, maybe. Uh, we go into, there's a certain Olympus of Cyrene, and he arrives, and he's prominent there. And uh, actually what happens is that he started off and uh, he lost all his money before he got to Alexandria and he had to support his family. He was a poor teacher uh, in a very humble situation uh, and um, basically starving to death. He's going, you know what? I think I'm going to go to Alexandria, swallow my pride. He gets there and he's good at what he does. Uh, and so what he does is that he decides to create a catalog of all known Greek writings, which is a mammoth undertaking. Uh, in fact, the full title is almost as long. It's called the Tables of Persons Eminent in Every Branch of Learning Together with a List of Their Writings. That's the title. <laughs> they summed it up as tables, uh, pedex in Greek. Uh, he wrote uh, 120 books <laughs> to include his entire list of all these books that they had. Uh, he divided uh, the collection into two basic categories, poetry and prose, and then subdivisions. Uh, for poetry, it was epic, tragedy, comedy, lyric. For prose, he broke it down to history, literature, science, medicine, which defined these areas a little bit further. Um, then, uh, what he did is that um, he, uh, he listed each author, there he goes, and each author then had a summary of who he is and what books he wrote. So, for example, uh, you'll have uh, Eudoxus, father of Skenes, of Canudos. This is, I'm reading actually from one of his identifications. It says, it says, astronomer, gym, uh, physician, Legislator, he studied geometry under Archytas and medicine under Philistian of Sicily. Pretty good, huh? That's that's the notation. Um, and so he goes on these tables um, that were obviously helped organize the library. Oh, so he came up with another idea. He said, you know what? Um, Callimachus believed literary artists should be free of constantly copying uh, the style of Homer. He says, you know, we need to break free of all that. <laughs> you know, we need to create something new, something fresh. Uh, he said he declared that artists should, quote, drive their wagons on untrodden fields, unquote. We need to investigate new ideas, new ways of thought. Callimachus claimed he had a vision of the god Apollo who told him to fatten his flocks but to keep his muse slender. <laughs> Fatten his flocks, keep his muse slender. And then somebody says, I don't understand what you're saying. And he says, big book, big evil. Mega biblion, mega, mega cockon. <laughs> he actually said that. <laughs> so, big book, big evil. <laughs> oh, okay, we get it now. So, so if you're gonna say something short, uh, make sure it's creative, but that's better than making it really long and bombastic, especially the word bombastic. A movie. Okay, so uh, Callimachus, uh, he also wrote various other works, uh, and uh, but it cost him because his rival was a name was a guy by the name of Apollonius of Rhodes. Apollonius of Rhodes is very famous. You guys have ever heard of Jason and the Argonauts? That's Apollonius of Rhodes, and the two were rivals. You know, actually, Callimachus uh, was the teacher some of, some of the time of, of, uh, of, of the other, but uh, oh well. Uh, what happens, they fought back and, back and forth uh, constantly, appalling us of Rhodes. We actually have even poetry that they wrote as opposing to each other. They fought one another. Uh, at one point, Apollonius of Rhodes gets kind of thrown out of Alexandria. Uh, but uh, he improves his Jason Argonauts, and then he arrives back again, and everybody loves it and makes Polemicus real unpopular. And a long story short is they choose uh, Apollonius of Rhodes to be the next director over, over Polemicus. So the next director of the museum uh, is the famous author of Jason the Argonauts. Did you guys know that? 
So there you have it. Uh, basic, basically, what uh, you wrote down, I mean, I, there's a few other things I want to say. Oh, yeah, wait, I'm, I'm reading right now insults between the two of them. <laughs> wait, uh, Callimachus said that he has, uh, that his, his uh, noggin is made out of mahogany. <laughs> so I couldn't resist. These are just fun reading some of these going back. So we basically have one of the earliest literary fights going back and forth, and it's very entertaining for people uh, to watch them fight amongst each other. So Apollonius now becomes the director, and he creates his uh, Argonautica. Uh, and who's going to be attracted during this time? You guys ever heard of Archimedes? Yeah. So uh, Archimedes, uh, he's from, of course, Syracuse. Uh, but um, what happened is, guess what? Not a lot of creative uh, uh, opportunity there. <laughs> Once again, you know, they're basically using him, these dictators of Syracuse, and he wants to go kind of do his own thing. He wants to have freedom, just like the earlier one when it came to medical practices. Alexandria was a great place to be because there's no censorship. You can think outside the box without any limitations. That's what drew people there. Well, and free food, free wine, free lodging, and all the books. But that also, <laughs> I mean, that the freedom of thought was also a great uh, contribution. Obviously, the Ar Archimedes uh, screw, uh, as, as well as his, his means of figuring out volume, but uh, that would be another volume of information. Moving right along, Ptolemy III, uh, 246 to 232, uh, was the next uh, patron of the museum. And this is where he has an idea. You know, what's, what's better than having one library? have two. That's right. He's the one that came up with the idea of two libraries in Alexandria. This is going to answer lots of your, your questions when it comes to the burning of the Library of Alexandria. Which one? <laughs> so you'll see throughout the ages, when one burns, the other supplies copies. When the other burns, the other supplies copies. You got two. Uh, that's a smart strategy by any means. And you're gonna see this, and I'll document it as we go along the way, but it should be uh, pretty interesting. So the, uh, the Temple of Serapis was then open to the general public, but there is a slight difference in the number of volumes. The Library of Alexandria, excuse me, uh, Library of Alexandria, boy, there you go, Malwedge. <laughs> The Library of Alexandria, there we go, and my voice got lower, um, uh, had 490,000 books. 490,000 books. The library at the Temple of Serapis had 42,800. See a difference? A little bit. So the 490000. For the one, the museum that's next to, well, connected to the palace. And the Temple of Serapis one is 42800. Hope it helps. So you're going to have a variance uh, in numbers. Obviously, the, the Serapium is a lot smaller because it covered uh, a, a smaller uh, space. Um, we have uh, Johannes Tietzes in the 12th century, who also keeps a list. Uh, and he says, well, they're numbered 400,000 mixed rolls inside the palace quarter, 90,000 unmixed rolls, with another 42,800 outside, making a total of 532,800 scrolls. And that's from his, his uh, pro legomonia. So um, we have some numbers here. And he's, of course, quoting earlier sources from that. Is this interesting? So now we know how many volumes that are there. You, you did notice that they mentioned 42,800 outside. That would most likely be the Serapium. You did notice also 90,000 unmixed rolls that are not designated uh, to be either one. Where are those? Okay, so I'm gonna go into this quickly. What they did. 
is that it had warehouses. And these warehouses were located by the harbor. And these uh, mixed roles were there. They also had by the harbor, as we know from the primary sources, is that people would arrive with these, these various books from all over, and they go through a sifting process before they're deposited in either one of the libraries. But beyond that, these warehouses were, were meant for export. Remember, I, we, people always forget Alexandria is the center of book production. These books are going out throughout the Eastern Mediterranean, and they're constantly being shipped out all over. And so we got to remember there are tons of books that are constantly being shipped out and end up in places like Ephesus, as we know, uh, places like Delos, as we know, uh, places like Athens, as we know, as recorded, places like Rhodes, as we know, places like Rome. Are you, are you guys getting the point? So there's a lot of books going on. They're not all a library, <laughs> but uh, there's lots of books. And again, it's the center of book production. Okay. So Ptolemy uh, III, uh, he was frustrated about uh, not having uh, the, uh, uh, the earliest versions of uh, Seclitus and Sophocles and Euripides. He is the one who, who grabbed it from Athens <laughs> and for a million bucks, uh, he let them keep uh, their deposit and you know, whatever. The point of the matter is, is that he's the one who created the definitive version of these playwrights. So the versions we have of these great masters of tragedy and comedy and satire are from the library of Alexandria. All right. Well, moving right along. Of course, 6,000 drachmas worth. Okay, moving on. So now Ptolemy III, uh, as we go here, uh, we'll, we'll suddenly, of course, obviously have uh, another director that will arrive, and you're going to love this guy. I mean, we're not even to the best. We're still not at the best part yet. You're thinking, what? <laughs> um, Aristophanes, not Aristophanes, but Aristophanes, E-R-A-T-O-S-T-H-E-N-E-S, -E -E was the next librarian, the next head. Um, he was ridiculed. They called him Beta. Uh, they called him the B-Man as opposed to Alpha because he was a master. Uh, he was actually good at so many different areas, but supposedly not the master of all. So they call him the B-Guy, the Beta guy. I don't think that's fair. Uh, Aristophanes was the one to calculate the entire circumference of the world. He's the first one to do so. Uh, from calculations he made in Egypt, uh, first in Alexandria, in comparison to a, a town known as Serene in Aswan today, uh, he wanted to know, and he did know, the exact mathematical position of the sun at its zenith in Alexandria during the summer solstice, and of course, hearing that the sun was blocked by a deep well uh, in the other location, Aswan. Uh, Aristophanes decided to make a calculation of the sun at its zenith during the summer solstice at this town, which happened directly on the Tropic of Cancer. He made his measures, uh, and he, of course, made a, triangulated it, and he realized that there's a difference between the two, and he calculated that. What did he get? Uh, he said the circumference of the Earth uh, as he saw it, uh, was 24,900.8 miles. 24,900.8 miles. So, you know, that's what he got. You know, and I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's 24,902. <laughs> Wait a second. Hey, that's pretty good. Hey, that's two miles. It matters. Okay. The point of the matter is he did it. The world is round. Is this good? Library of Alexandria. I, are you amazed yet at his, at his knowledge? Then he decided to make a map of the known world. This map uh, had the Mediterranean. It looks very much like the Mediterranean as it is today. Uh, of course, France is the land of the Celts. Britain is on the map. 
There's an island that is called Iron, I-E-R-N-E, -E, which is exactly where Ireland is. This is fascinating. There is a place called Thule in the north. It looks like Sweden, sticking down. The Black Sea is exactly accurate. The Caspian Sea is accurate. There's even the river, rivers on the steppes. North Africa is very accurate. With the Nile's course along the Red Sea, the Arabian Peninsula, Iran, called Irana, is represented. Afghanistan, Bactria is on this map. India is on this map, with both the Indus and the Ganges being represented. The island of Ceylon is there, and then the, the map goes blank. But hey, that's a nice, large part of the world that is known. If that's not enough, he created a calendar based upon his measurements of the ecliptic about the Earth, and came up with, well, uh, 365 days for a year, but also determined every fourth year, there should be 366 days. And so there should be a leap year. This idea, would later leap in uh, to Julius Caesar, uh, who also used the same library. We'll go into that for information. We'll even have the name of the, of the person who did that. This is fascinating. And so this is where these calculations uh, take place. Also, he came up with uh, other things, including the sieve of Aristophanes, which is an algorithm that is still used to identify prime numbers. Uh, brilliant guy. So much for being the beta guy. <laughs> All right. I see him as the as the alpha guy. Let's, let's you know give him, uh, credit there. Okay, so uh, what will happen now uh, is that uh, next you have the reign of Ptolemy the fourth. Aristophanes continued to be uh, the librarian under Ptolemy the fifth. Uh, he's kind of a five year old. Uh, you're going to have kind of a lot of uh, problems going on. Uh, tumultuous period in Alexandrian history. During this time, the person in charge. The, of the library, his name is Aristophanes of Byzantium. He was the director in charge from 205 to 185. Every one of you, um, you uh, uses what this person came up with every single day. Ooh, dramatic pause. Of course, it's a dramatic pause intentionally. Why? Wow, what did he come up with? Well, um, he came up with the idea of what's called distinctions. He said that, you know what, when we read sentences, we don't know how long to take a breath in between each one. We don't know when to stop or when to pause. We need to create a system to determine that. So for, especially for poetry, but also for prose, so if it is a short pause, we're gonna to put together a dot that is placed in the mid-level, and we're gonna call that a comma, using that exact word. If it's a longer pause, we're gonna put the dot on the bottom at the end of this word unit, and we're gonna call it a colon, using that exact word. And then, if it's a complete stop, we're going to put the dot on top at the end, and we're going to call that a periodus, which is a period. Our punctuation system arises from the library of Alexandria. Is that fascinating? Well, we really are influenced by it. You've seen this zoology and, and mathematics and all these areas, a categorization. There's more still. Aristophanes also created something that says, you know what, we need to know where to put the accent, which should be a mark. He's the one who came up with the accent marks over various words, which then later on during the Byzantine period, he used too much in the Greek language. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so accents are everything. Anyway, but, uh, there you have it. Is that making sense? So you're going to have that coming about. All right. Well, Aristophanes also uh, uh, fixed up of the Iliad and the Odyssey, wanted to make it even better uh, when it came to the versions, so he did that. Uh, Aristophanes, uh, he hated people who did what's called plagiarism. Uh, one time they had uh, various speeches, and uh, uh, he's, he became very angry. He said, all of you are committing plagiarism except for one of you, and they didn't believe him. So he walked into the library, 
and re replying just on memory from certain bookcases produce an armful of rolls showing exactly which passages they had claimed as their own and reading it verbatim. <laughs> That's a great librarian. What a hero, I tell you. <laughs> okay, I made my point. Okay, so moving on, uh, we have, of course, now a petition. Uh, Eumenes uh, III, uh, King of Pergamum in Asia Minor, says, oh yeah, well, if they can have a library, so can we. And so arrives the competition. And so they create their own uh, special library that's located next to uh, the temple uh, of Athena, which is pretty fitting. I have actually been and walked through uh, the rooms of this particular temple, or what? Are, sorry, the, the library, what they identify uh, as the library, which seems to fit as much as 200,000 books. So there you have that. So, um, uh, of course, uh, what will happen is uh, Alexandria says, you're not going to get any paper from us. And Pergamon says, well, that's fine. We'll just use our own invention, which is not an inventor at all. I mean, of course, parchment, they made parchment beyond, way beyond this, but maybe they made a special kind of parchment, which is basically animal skins that are, you know, obviously wiped down, cleaned down, and dried, and everything else. That became their paper, a lot more expensive. But Pergamon practiced then the art of parchment making. Uh, meanwhile, of course, Alexandria was still shipping out all of the papyrus. I want to make a comment that will matter a little bit later on, and I will just say this, and that is parchment lasts longer. Papyrus does not last longer. <laughs> All right, just keep that in mind as we go there, okay? So papyrus doesn't last as long. It's like one of those situations where it hits the air, like, ah, oh. uh, after many centuries, you're gonna be very careful, especially the archeologists, the Oxeronicus, and I'll just have to be make very careful as they go through each layer. Uh, parchment tends to last a lot longer. Uh, this has a bearing on the Library of Alexandria in a way that seems pretty mundane, but you'll see later. Okay. So now, now this is Pop Pergamon does this, and there's kind of a competition between the two. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, what will happen is a uh, um, uh, Aristophanes of, of Byzantium, he wanted to uh, become their librarian, and they actually threw him in jail so he wouldn't uh, join the Pergamon. Maybe he's not getting enough perks. Okay, uh, so moving right along. So what will happen is, is that now we're entering a period of time uh, where there's lots of controversy. Uh, but uh, what will happen is, is that uh, <clears throat> Pergamon has a library. Why can't Melitus have one? Hey, Melitus has one. You know, why can't Rhodes have one? Hey, Rhodes has one. You know, Athens should have had this one a long time ago. <laughs> hey, Athens has one. Ephesus is what are we? And all of a sudden, you have this multiplicity. Meanwhile, Rome goes, hey, <laughs> we're going to have one too. And everybody's now making their own libraries, and they're all over. So Alexandria becomes less unique uh, as this idea spreads throughout. I've actually visited uh, not only the library of Celsus in, Al in uh, Ephesus, but I've also visited the library of Nyssa uh, and seen where they put in the wooden cases into the wall. It's still preserved, uh, and it's on three stories high. Pretty amazing. Uh, they had a a stairway, uh, apparently, that rolled from all the different areas with a, with a small porch on the sides. But wow, pretty exciting stuff. Uh, so um, all right, the next director is Aristarchus. Uh, what does he do? I mean, he can't possibly do something more amazing than you know, many punctuation. Well, what he did is he went through the various literary writings of the Greeks. And he says, you know what, let's go over and explain the various words and what they mean and what the passages mean. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to write in between each sentence connections, not only what the words mean, but where these ideas come from. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to talk about this. He invents the commentary. You want to read a commentary? So he's went through and he created commentary versions of various classical works. And you're thinking, okay, 
He can't go beyond that. Oh, yeah. So then what he does, same guy, Aristarchus, uh, what he does is that he's inspired uh, by a certain Politius, who we met earlier, you know, the guy that was against the uh, uh, people uh, uh, who were not meticulous enough and who, who lied and plagiarized. Uh, who was, okay, but anyway, uh, basically what he did, uh, Philippus, he wrote a work called Miscellaneous Words, where identified a series of words and their origins and meanings in no consistent order. So what Aristarchus does is, does is goes, you know what I'm going to do? This has no order. I'm going to put it all in alphabetical order. So we have the word, and then we have the definition. He invented the dictionary. <laughs> okay, now you're sitting there going, wow, it looks like all the literary arts come about because of the Library of Alexandria. Yes, they do. <laughs> That's why it's so important. And those ideas then spread to all these other libraries. So that we are talking about the establishment of the library, the library sciences. Okay. So um, he also creates something that's called a lexicon too. He invented that. So commentary, uh, dictionary, uh, lexicon, all the same guy, Aristarchus. Thank you so much for that contribution. Um, uh, I'm going to read you one. It's for fun. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention. We have a lot of these still left and quoted by other scholars. Uh, here it is. The word is molegia. I'm reading his definition. A Scythian beverage. It's good. Glaucus, in his first book of descriptions of places lying toward the left of the Black Sea, says as follows When the drivers agreed, he dismissed the assembly. And they, dispersing each to his own house, prepared a melagia. The definition still continues. This drink is more intoxicating than wine. It is made of honey boiled with water, with the addition of a certain herb. For their country produces much honey and also beer, which they made out of millet. Period. That's it. Pretty good. What do you think? Does it sound like a modern uh, dictionary description? Real well done. Sometimes they're shorter, though. Uh, for the word melodia, uh, he writes absolute term for tragedy. And then he says, see Callimachus's commentaries. Yeah, the idea of see this, see that, documentation like that, that's the library of Alexandria. Well, are you guys overwhelmed yet <laughs> with all this information? Uh, there's a lot going on here. Uh, of course, uh, Dionysus Thrax was there. Uh, 170 to 90 BCE, what did he put together? He put together the very first grammar book for a language, a systematic grammar book, and that was still used uh, by the Greeks even into the 4th and 5th century CE. Uh, he put this together. Grammar books, yeah, thank you again, because <laughs> there needs to be a more systematic way of learning these kinds of things. Okay, well then, unfortunately, uh, we get somebody to the throne, uh, Ptolemy the Eighth in 145. Uh, since smart people did not support him, I'm, I'm saying this intentionally, he wanted all the smart people gone. <laughs> so, okay, so what happened is, is that basically a brain drain going on in Alexandria uh, because they didn't support his rule. Uh, he was, um, uh, well, first of all, uh, he was just, um, he's very much an autocrat, uh, belligerent, um, and uh, did lots of terrible things. And basically scholars uh, were against him. So he expelled philosophers, mathematicians, musicians, painters, athletic trainers. This is a list. Athletic trainers. How could they be a threat? Okay. Uh, physicians and other men of skill in their profession according to Athenaeus and the Nosophists. They just throw them all out. So, so who's going to be the new head of the Library of Alexandria? He, cho he chose a certain Sidus of the Spearman. <laughs> he made one of his soldiers. <laughs> yeah, you're in charge. So for a while, Alexandria is not doing very well. But don't worry, it comes back, it uh, goes back again. And by the time we get to the first century CE, uh, you're going to have Didymus of Alexandria, 
which is 63 to 10 CE. Uh, and um, he took on many different challenges. He again summarized all the Greek literature. He did so in 4,000 books. <laughs> uh, it was given the name Bronze Guts. Okay, so obviously these would probably be scrolls as opposed to actual books in our sense, because that would exceed the number of, I mean, too, too big. So let's get to Julius Caesar. Let's get into this conspiracy. The story goes that Julius Caesar, one of the versions of, of the destruction of the library, Julius Caesar burned the library of Alexandria at least one of the versions. It's pretty great. Unfortunately, uh, nobody at the time knew about it. But, so here we go. Yeah, so in, in uh, 48 BCE, he chased uh, Pompey and his allies to Egypt. The Civil War divided the land between Ptolemy the, uh, the, the, uh, the 13th and, of course, his older sister, who we know as Cleopatra. In the middle of the chaos, the Egyptians seized the ships in the harbor of Alexandria, thereby cutting off any potential supplies arriving from outside of Egypt, and it did jeopardize uh, Caesar's abilities to receive reinforcements. In respond to this threat, Caesar, quote, according to him in the Civil Wars, burned all these vessels and those in the dockyards since he could not protect so wide an area with his small fleet, unquote, book three, uh, 111, okay? So Caesar then seized Pharaoh's island with a lighthouse, he liked that, although he destroyed everything else in the island, he liked the lighthouse and used that for his procession later on. According to Florus, Caesar was so impressed with the, uh, uh, the, uh, li uh, sorry, the lighthouse uh, that he ordered a mini rec recreation of it. According to Alias Hurtius, one of his lieutenants, he states that Alexandria is almost completely secure against fire. The buildings have no carpentry or timber and are composed of masonry and constructed in arches and roof with rough cast or flagstones, he mentions in his Alexandrian War. He also discussed how they used 10 story high, uh, uh, highly mobile siege towers against the walls. But uh, after that, they took the city. And guess where Caesar spent the night? He spent the night in the palace. Wait, the library is located in the palace. No, but Dr. Reed felt the library burned down. I don't think Julius Caesar is going to be spending the night in a burned down building. <laughs> it did not burn down. It did not. Then, of course, in 24, Strabo came to Alexandria. He also mentions, all still intact, quote, the inner royal palaces, which are continuous with those on Lucas and have groves and numerous lodges painted in various colors. He described the palace as the quarters still being there. It's still there. The only place he mentioned any destruction is on Ferris Island. That's 24 uh, BCE. Uh, again, hello, no fire. Are you seeing that? It didn't happen. Wait. So then you have in the first century CE, I love tracking this down, sorry. You have Luca between 38 to 65, who all of a sudden, hey, he's a poet, he starts to spin. He says, nor did the fire fall upon the vessels only. The houses near the sea caught fire from the spreading heat and the wind fanned the conflagage, uh, uh, the fire, until uh, the flames uh, spitten by the edding gale rushed over the roofs as fast as meteors that often trace a furrow along the sky, though they have nothing solid to feed on and burr by means of air alone. But he doesn't mention the fire at the, at the, at the, uh, uh, at the library, but something happened now. Now all of a sudden, while one of, the, one of the soldiers there saying, you know, nothing burned, now you're having somebody saying, hey, something burned, and it started to spread. So guess what happens? Start people thinking, ah, oh, if it spread, maybe it burned the books. So we get to the next, this is 100 years later, by the way, this is written. Okay. So then uh, you get to Seneca the Younger, who mentions this, uh, and he mentions uh, the fact that, um, uh, 
a, a, a number of books and libraries whose titles their owners can hardly read uh, were destroyed. So now Seneca takes this leap uh, and adds also 40,000 books were burned in Alexandria. They have been collected merely for ostentatious display. Wait a second, 40,000 books? Hey, that fits the miscellaneous books that we heard numbered earlier. <laughs> that's, that's not in the Serapium. That's not in the palace. That's in the same dock areas we talked about. Bingo, is that pretty interesting? So it looks like there are books in the docking area that were burned, but that's not the library of Alexandria. Is this cool? Let's keep on going. <laughs> I love this. So now we get to the time of Hadrian. Finally, during the time of Hadrian, uh, we have people talking about the fact that many battles occur between the two forces with the results of the docks and storehouses of grain among other buildings were burned and also the library. Wait, this is the first mention of it. This is 200 years later. Is this interesting? So what's happening here, it's called rumor. But there are other things happening at the same time. Meanwhile, how many does Seneca and others mention? It's always 40,000. Well, we know there's way more than 40,000. It's the same group of miscellaneous books that we saw earlier. Okay, so the books didn't burn. You guys got that. So in fact, uh, the best example of evidence that the books didn't burn is business continued as usual. What do you mean? They continue to have librarians. They continue to have meetings. They continue to have symposiums as business as usual, written during the first century into the second century. So we still have them. Uh, so, um, so kept on going, uh, for example, uh, Didymus was, was a director uh, during the, the time of Julius Caesar, uh, and Pliny the Elder also mentions the fact that business was going on as usual. He also mentions a famous uh, thinker there known as Sausagenus of Alexandria, uh, who, talked, who was connected to three main schools, the Chaldean, the Egyptian, and the Greek. Uh, and uh, he is the one, of course, who suggested the idea of leap year going to Julius Caesar. This is where the connection goes, which goes back to Aristophanes. Oh, oh well, a little earlier, I got to forget to mention, in 41 BCE, Mark Antony decided to give his love Cleopatra a very special gift, and that was the 2,000, uh, sorry, the, the 2,000, uh, I'd say 200,000 uh, volumes from the Pergamon Library. And it says, in addition to the current library. So wait a minute. So that current library was still there. Uh, and, um, you know, Anthony says, hey, Cleopatra, you know that rival, you know, Pergamon had the great library? Well, guess what? You're getting that collection. Yay. A lot of people said, oh, no. Mark Anthony did that to replace the burned down, uh, burned down volumes. You know, they lost all these volumes, and that's why he's doing it. No, there's no evidence for that. It's an addition to, but hey, you know, nobody reads Greek anymore. Moving right along. So, so we keep on going. Is this fun? So it continued going on during that time. You have another person at the library during the first century. Uh, his name is Caramon of Alexandria, uh, who was a superintendent of the Donard Library of the Temple of Serapis as well. He was a priest. Uh, he was a uh, um, uh, he wrote various works on the mysteries, especially Egyptian astrology. Uh, also, he said that the uh, Egyptian religion was actually the worship of simply nature, stories to be understood as allegories, typologies, underlining this understanding. Uh, he wrote many works. And an emperor by the name of Claudius Caesar, he decided that, you know what? Let's have a yet another addition to the Library of Alexandria and we're going to name it after me, and my Etruscan history is to be re read there each year from beginning to end. <laughs> uh, so there, according to Suetonius. So we have now yet another. So so it looks like this library is is not only not destroyed; it's getting bigger. It's expanding uh, in size. In fact, uh, in in seventy nine CE. According to Cassius Dio, the Octavian building or the portico of Octavia 
together with those books were destroyed. So in 81, uh, what will happen is the Emperor Domitian, according to Suetonius, provided for having the libraries, which were destroyed by fire, renewed at very great expense, seeking everywhere for copies of the lost works and sending scribes to Alexandria to, to, to transcribe and to correct them, unquote. So still going strong, and those books were then brought to Rome, the copies. Well, then, of course, according to the Historia Augusta, Adrian, when he toured the area, uh, what he did uh, is uh, Philostratus notes that he, <laughs> that he put one of his favorites as director of the Library of Alexandria because he wanted to have, get this, free meals at the museum, unquote. <laughs> Everybody loves this free food. You got to love it. Uh, according to the Oxyronicus Papyrus from 173 CE, it describes, of course, the purchase of a boat by a certain Valerius Diodorus, who is, who is member of, described as a member of the museum. We have even more documentation. It goes on uh, for forever. Uh, Athenaeus uh, in, in 232 CE also writes about uh, the library. So um, you, you're getting the point. So, okay, Dr. Riefeld, when is this thing going to get destroyed? I mean, it just keeps on going. Uh, so what will happen is, is that, um, unfortunately, the palace one is destroyed, not the Serapium. And I'm going to give you uh, the most likely year in 273 CE. 273 CE. When Aurelian recaptured the city, much of the palace district was indeed destroyed. In fact, the historian Amalianus Marcellinus writes the quarrels of the citizens turned into deadly strife, and her walls were destroyed, and she lost the greater part of the district of Bruchen, which had long been the abode of distinguished men, including Aristarchus, eminent and thorny problems of grammatical lore. Uh, and of course, uh, continues the wealth, uh, business, wealthy businessmen and leaders of the revolt were described as owning, quote, so many books that he used to often say in public that he should support any army on paper and glue. Okay, anyway, moving on around. So, so we're having books being destroyed, but this whole palace is laid low. In fact, uh, it is so destroyed, uh, it, it, it even gets overwhelmed again in 298, another destruction, which completely destroys. So if it wasn't destroyed in 272, three, excuse me, it was destroyed in 298 because the rest of the area was then laid flat uh, completely to the point by 390, uh, it was outside the city walls and anchorites lived there. <laughs> and slowly but surely the area was taken over by water. And today the section of the palace is now currently underwater of Alexandria. So it was turning into marsh though already uh, in the late 300s into the 400s, and I find that interesting. Okay, so you're thinking, okay, but what about, we still have it, we still have the Serapium. So the daughter library keeps on going. It is not destroyed. They still have, again, they don't talk about the museum as much until we get to the latter half of the 300s. Then they start talking about the museum again, which I find is interesting. We'll go there in a few moments. Uh, but what will happen is as follows is that uh, Constantine the Great, Constantine the Great arrives and he wants to have a library of Constantinople. So what he does is that uh, he starts making copies of various books of Christian literature, uh, as well as early church fathers to fill this new library. But Constantius, his son, has other ideas. He ruled from 337 to 361. He hired a scholar by the name of Themistus, and Themistus uh, was placed in charge of collecting all the copies for the Library of Constantinople. And uh, so, by the way, uh, Themistus remained a pagan until the very end of his days, uh, and uh, he was allowed to to uh, bring in any book he wanted. So what he what he did. His Themistus, what he did is he went to the Library of Alexandria and he started to have their collection copied on parchment 
and then place into the library of Alexandria. Are you guys getting my point? Okay, so that's, of course, you know, but what, which library is this? Well, th this would have to be the one at Serapion because already the one at the palace is gone. Does that make sense? So this is being copied down in Constantinople. And uh, one interesting factor is parchment survives and papyrus starts breaking apart. And, what, and so what's going to happen is that the copies in Constantinople stay and remain longer while the maintenance in the library of Alexandria of keeping these things together are not so good and they start to crumble. Are you guys, so it actually starts to disintegrate in which, you know, the upkeep. Uh, they've lost a lot in the way of finances. If you know the history of Alexandria during the 200s and 300s, it's not a great century, two centuries to live in for them. It's like construction every 30 years uh, and lots of problems when it comes to infrastructure. Uh, but uh, there you have it. But uh, then what will happen uh, is that the Library of Constantinople, this is good, it will have 120,000 books. And these are copies, but on parchment from the Library of Alexandria. This Library of, Al of, of Constantinople burned in 473. And you're thinking, oh, no, no. The majority of the books were not only rescued from the flames, but because they had a great catalog list of all the books, they were able to replace the rest of them within three years and reestablish another library. Wait, hey, this is a part of the Library of Alexandria, now in Constantinople, placed on parchment, which is a long lasting material. Yes, it continues on in Constantinople. In fact, uh, we know it's alive and well, even in 680 CE at the Sixth Ecumenical Council of Ephesus, there's a certain Agathon the Reader who is a librarian at this establishment and he was designated as a notary for the meeting. So when did this, when did this library disappear? God, this is awful. The year 1204, thank you Fourth Crusade. It was the West, the Latin West that destroyed destroyed the remnants of the Library of Alexandria. You just can't make this up. Is this sad? <laughs> this is where we lose the knowledge, although fortunately a lot of that knowledge was already being transferred over to the West gradually, but uh, this is where the burning goes about. Okay, okay, so let's flash back and let's move over uh, back to Alexandria. So you have the Serapium, it's continuing. What happens there? Well, unfortunately, what happens there is uh, Theodosius the Great, who's probably not that great, orders the destruction of the Serapium in the year 391, uh, and it is destroyed, it's pulled apart, and that's the end of the library. Maybe. <laughs> what do you mean, maybe? Uh, okay, we know there are two members, according to uh, various writings. Uh, Aphonius as well, uh, and that we know for a fact that a certain Theon was involved in, in this museum during the 300s, and of course, his daughter. I'm not sure if you guys ever heard of her before, but her name is Hypatia of Alexandria. She was associated with the museum, and you're going, Dr. Riedfeld, where, 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 where are you going to find uh, this evidence? Well, you see, the fun part is, is that she wrote her students, and even though her writings don't survive, Synethius, great name, his writings survive, and he records that fact. Yay! And even describes some of the statues that survived. Wait a second, but it's after 391. What does that mean? And they call it the museum again. That means after the destruction of the Serapium, those those tenacious Alexandrians created yet another museum. Yeah, I love them. <laughs> and that continues, although I'm sure uh, the books were in a decrepit state of repair. I'm sure it was nothing like it ever was. And so, of course, you're going to think to yourself, okay, and so this is when the Muslims destroy the Library of Alexandria and uh, they get the works of Aristotle. You know, suppose a story, 
that happened in 640, where we blame Islam. Yeah, where's that source? Uh, what do you mean? So, uh, well, I, the earliest source I find for the supposed <clears throat> destruction of the Library of Alexandria in 640 uh, is uh, from Ab al Latif, who died in 1231. Okay. 1231. Uh, in his account of Egypt during the 12th century. You mean he didn't? And the second source arrives from Bishop Gregory Bar Hebraeus, who lived from 1226 to 1286. He's called Abba La Faraj in Arabic. Uh, his story about the destruction, uh, he's from again, uh, th this is the 13th century. By the way, kind of irony that these people are from the 13th century, the very century which saw the actual remnants of this library destroyed in 1204 by the Crusaders in Constantinople. Just throwing that one out for free. Uh, anyway, and he is full of er errors. He says, he says, Caliph Omar is made to say that dawn of Byzantium, uh, if those books are agreement with the Quran, we have no need of them. If they're opposed to the Quran, destroy them. Uh, the problem is that John of Byzantium, also known as John of Grammarian, lived in the 6th century and was long dead by the time the Muslims came into the picture. It's full of total errors. It's a fabrication. Fake news. It's not true. Got it? Wow. You woke up. So this is an anti-Muslim work. And the other is just way too late. You're going, okay, well, this is really disappointing. <laughs> you mean the great library of Alexandria kind of fell apart because of bad maintenance? <laughs> And, and 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 copied off in parchment by the Library of Constantinople, uh, and it was preserved. It continued to the time of the Crusades, and as the Crusaders have destroyed it, yeah. Oh, is there any hope? There is still hope, because one more little bit. Some of these volumes got connected to the Academy of Athens, and uh, and Justinian, while he closed the Academy of Athens. These scholars then moved with all their books to a place called Misbis, uh, crossing over uh, uh, into the, the, uh, the, the Parthian Empire. Good news, Muslims arrived. That's good news. And they, they actually acquire, uh, doing the Umayyads, th these collections, uh, these end up in Damascus, but they also end up in Babylon uh, in the great golden house of the Abbasids, and these these works are there, and who destroys them? Guess who? <laughs> That's right. Yes, of course, the Mongols. <laughs> so there you go. So 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 this knowledge, uh, although I have to say, gets disseminated in various places, uh, in various places in Greece, uh, in places uh, in uh, all over the Eastern Mediterranean. And so much of the remnants of these great works still survive today. Uh, sometimes very, very small, uh, like only one text survived in many cases. But so much of the knowledge of the Library of Alexandria does survive today. In fact, I know the names of a lot of those works. I have behind me over 3,000 works. Seriously, if I keep moving the camera up, I can't get it. On the screen here, uh, it, it would just keep on going and 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 going. You're getting my point. And I have a, it's triplicate. Uh, so, uh, and a lot of these books I know for a fact uh, were there and they're still there. And the problem is, and I have another stack here, you can see there, these are all in Greek, all these texts all the way to the floor. <laughs> the problem is, we have the works. Here's the problem. Nobody wants to read them. <laughs> we have these works. We have these mysteries. We have so much in the Library of Alexandria. I can give you a list of titles. You can start reading right now. You just got to learn Greek and you're on your way. But the problem is nobody wants to read them. So, so, so when you hear, when you see somebody wearing uh, one of these t-shirts, they're, they're so upset about it. Uh, maybe, you know, put together a list. You know, get them started reading uh, some of these great works because they're still around uh, to this day. Uh, sure, we lost a lot, but we have the biggest, greatest works 
most of them have survived uh, and classicists have it uh, and uh, it's pretty exciting. But again, nobody reads it. And so I think, I hope I have solved the mystery of the Library of Alexandria. Does that answer a lot of your questions? Maybe too many of your questions? <laughs> Maybe that's a, I covered it, uh, I think, pretty well. And you can see that uh, uh, somebody says about the destruction. You can say questions like, which one? <laughs> and when? <laughs> uh, and then, of course, you can give them also boring reasons where, you know, parchment is a much better uh, surface to write on than papyrus, which is basically you're writing on weeds. <laughs> That's going to last a long time. Well, I hope you learned a lot. Thank you so much. And voila, open up for questions. Thank you. Okay. Great lecture, Jim. Thank you so much. Yeah. Into that one. All right, any questions, thoughts, perspectives, epiphanies? Can you give us just a real quick, uh, just so people know, what happened to Hypatia? <laughs> yeah, Hy Hy Hypatia, uh, he, she was murdered uh, by the, the clergy, uh, um, little bits of glass tearing her flesh off of her. Yeah, yeah. Um, was, uh, was, was Cyril involved in that? Because I had read somewhere that the guy who became allegedly uh, Saint Cyril was involved yes, in that. He was involved in that. And it, 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 by the way, uh, since since we're here, um, I will I will tell you another story that people don't know. And <laughs> that's uh, did you guys know that uh, of course Orestes uh, was um, uh, who was administrator of Alexandria at that time was in her favor and one of, one of her patrons and and um, but the religious groups uh, especially the obviously what will become known as the Orthodox were very much against her but a lot of people loved her absolutely loved her and she appealed to various people of all different beliefs and perspectives uh, she had in her school which most likely was located in the museum if you listen to Smetheus who was one of her students who became a Christian bishop later on, and his correspondence survives. You want to learn about, about, uh, about uh, all about her? Read his writings. They're still there. I think it's kind of cool. I'm upset that her, her letters have not survived, but at least we get the echo, so to speak. But uh, very much the center of the intellectual set, uh, as established by her father, Theron. But the, what will happen is, is that she is murdered by basically a mob and it was an illegal mob and what you don't know is that uh, Theodosius II did an investigation as though people don't know this and he declared the action even though he was a Christian illegal and had those people who are part of that uh, exiled out of Alexandria and he wished that he could have brought the others to justice. This is part of the, the story uh, of Hypatia that nobody, don't show that in the movie. You're going, because you're thinking, you, you, you see, you hear the story of Hypatia, and you're thinking to yourself, such injustice, and the Christians really don't care, and they let this poor lady, you know, go through all this. No, Orestes and the others, uh, they all gathered together, including the emperor, and they did a full-fledged investigation. Uh, that would be a good movie to have the full story being told, but hey, it's not I haven't even seen the movie. I haven't even seen uh, the uh, movie, but you know, I just just my uh, own uh, reading yeah. over the years. But thank you because I didn't know that last part. So thank yeah, you. Nobody so much. Yeah. yeah, nobody does. Yeah, nobody does. I think it's it's so interesting. I think it's even even more interesting the fact that they did an investigation. Uh, I could picture in the movie uh, the, you know, the court trial because they did have one going through the questioning process and start the movie that way <laughs> and then go back. Okay, sorry. $10,000, maybe that's all. Yeah. Anything else? Any other questions, thoughts? All right, good. Let me see to cover everything. Covered a lot of space. Yeah, yeah, so we have, so Julius Caesar, a non-event, 
just so you know. You're going to see this in most textbooks. They will say it was burned during the time of Julius Caesar. So I, that's, that's why I intentionally took you through all the sources. And you, you don't even have a reference, even 100 years later, uh, to a fire burning any books. You just have all suddenly it's now spreading. <laughs> and you can see how this idea starts evolving only 200 years later. Now all of a sudden, and basically what most likely happened uh, is the 400,000 books uh, in the warehouses burned on the, that were being chipped out. And you, you hear the word books, you're going, oh, books, that must mean the library. And then you, you build it from there. Uh, but uh, it's interesting, that's how conspiracy theories all kind of form too. Uh, you know, they have this, these kinds of roots and then you just have to trace it. But uh, yeah, I figured Julius Caesar and, his, and, and the, uh, the soldiers with him and, and people who live there and also the caretakers who were there at the time probably know more than we do. <laughs> and business went on as usual uh, without a hiccup. Any other thoughts? Any perspectives? All right. Wow. I think you got it. I think I got it. Well, all right. Well, thank you for all, for coming uh, to my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. Like I said, if there's any other questions, you know, get your time's worth. I'm here for you. But uh, uh, it's wonderful to see all your faces. And uh, I hope that you will come again uh, to my talk on mummifications. My vacation, excuse me, because it will be as detailed. <laughs> Maybe even more so, if you don't mind. If you love detail, you're going to get it here, you know? <laughs> you know? I figure I always want to answer questions that people want to know. Uh, I've always been an inquisitive person with an insatiable appetite for knowledge. And, and so I like asking questions that uh, are based on questions upon questions upon questions and go down these various rabbit holes that I love these little journeys and places I, I explore along the way and I figure I'll take my listeners along with me uh, as we go to all these different places nicks and crannies and mysteries and I all actually right. have, I, I have a question um, can you hear me yes perfect okay, great I never know with my with my computer <laughs> um, so you had mentioned that uh, Alexandria was uh, the birthplace of, of a lot of things like a uh, more of an understanding of human anatomy um, and um, the one guy I forgot his name who estimated the circumference of the earth and Aristophanes so, and particle yes. physics and I'm wondering are those dictionaries. innovations uh, are those innovations or discoveries exclusive to that region of the world or were there other cultures like ancient China or the Mayans or Incans that were um, Kind of made those discoveries on their own. Yeah, you don't have a punctuation system that that comes about. That's only like the Library of Alexandria, uh, and that, of course, by the way, the punctuation system goes into the Arabic. So that it arises from there. So no, it starts there. When it comes to anatomy, that's again only there. It's the compass of the earth. It's there. Yeah, pretty much. A dictionary. Uh, you're going to have Chinese dictionaries, but not that early. You have, you have dictionaries that go back into the first and second centuries CE, but that's still after in a, in a chronological sense. So that's after. So the first zoo, uh, there, there's, there's controversy over the first zoo. Uh, some, some people will, will say that the first, there's a, uh, you're going to have a, a zoo-like place uh, that was in the Marian Empire. Uh, the, you know, there was some, something like a zoo, but it turns out the Marian Empire's zoo and Patuputra it came, uh, was, um, was about a few decades after the zoo in the Library of Alexandria. And it turns out most likely it was the library that influenced it. Uh, so fascinating. Uh, in fact, uh, we, I can, we can go there too. I, it's another wonderful talk. I'm not talking about India, but uh, interesting stuff. So that's later on. So a dictionary, uh, uh, commentaries. Yeah, this is the beginning. Doesn't mean be very clear. Doesn't mean that the same idea that's not connected to the library didn't occur elsewhere, but still in chronological time it happened later. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so you still have it later. The Chinese come up with quite a few ideas during the Han Dynasty. And the question is, is there a connection over the trade routes? That's a controversy, but it's still, it, it's still afterwards. You know, they didn't have this during the 
the Shang Dynasty, or uh, this is making sense. So you don't have this. Um, so yeah, so that answers your question. So this is the first time for so much. Uh, and uh, again, the fascinating part is the idea of the accents or the various markings go into various languages after this fact, uh, even uh, Middle Eastern languages. So yeah. Uh, and one thing that happens, of course, again, we're going to have the golden house uh, under the, you know, as, as we go through the Abbasids. Uh, this is very important. And a part of that legacy uh, is you will have Aristotle. You know, you will have these great scientific works. I didn't mention this. I should mention this right now, that those great works of that golden house spread across North Africa. And... Uh, you know, those ideas spread and arrived uh, in a place later on. Of course, you guys have heard of Spain. Uh, so, you know, even though this is during the Umayyad part times, but also into the Abbasid, Sea, you have the same thing. Um, but, you know, but the Umayyads would take some of the knowledge uh, at Damascus and bring them over uh, to Spain. And then, of course, it'll be overlaid by the Abbasids later on. The influence will go across and over. And so a lot of that ends up in, in Spain. And then with the Reconquista, that information then goes into Western Europe. A lot of this, a lot of these books were originally deposited in the Library of Alexandria. Uh, I'll be real boring again. Is that yes? Obviously, you're going to have lots of works. You know, all the works of Plato and Aristotle there. That's that's a given. But they also have there are a whole list of books that are Middle Platonists and Neoplatonists. They seem to love those philosophies there, tons and tons of those works, which I have right there, and that nobody wants to read. <laughs> so uh, so we know about that too. Um, it, again, we're back to the problem of we have these books, but people just don't want to read them. They're not interested. And I think we're looking for something magical and mysterious. Uh, you know, maybe discovering something that's connected to Atlantis or something like that. And and, and um, other stuff that's connected to Atlantis, well, you know, yeah, but not really. <laughs> you know, Atlantis is just a part of the conversation. It's not really, you know, you're going to have um, references to ideas that are not necessarily well documented, you know, circumstantial evidence. Uh, you have to get into the mindset of those people at that time. And again, uh, a lot of this wonderful materials, I, I say the best of the materials we still have to this day. Huh. Too bad. I, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think of the film Agora? Okay. So I absolutely love the, love the movie. I really did. I really do love the movie. And I own the movie. I watch it quite often. Uh, uh, you know, obviously there's problems historically when it comes to her, her conics. You know, it comes to, you know, you know, her Theon was part was connected to the idea of conic, uh, looking into uh, circles and cones and so forth in the mathematical sense. Uh, but um, I think that it would have been even more interesting if it went into some of, of, of what she really did talk about and really did study. Uh, she, uh, we do have remnants of materials where it turned out that Theon was a great mathematician. And what she did is uh, he was an expert at algebra. Okay. And what she did is that she took his additions and added commentaries on it because it's too hard for people to understand. It is that form of algebra that we inherit. The Arabs took to give back to us. It was her explanations that made that possible, that really made algebra more systematic, that went directly uh, into the Umayyads and the Abbasids. And of course, it comes back to us. People don't know that. That's, that, was, that was known then. Well, you know, that's part, of, that's part of the erasure of, of women from history right there, because yes. you know, in school, we're always taught that it was the Arabs who invented um, algebra. No, Theon, the father, yeah. the father of Hypatia, is the one had it long before. He just made it systematic in the way that Euclid made geometry systematic. Yeah. Because ancients had geometry way before. I mean, you can see this in, in, in Egypt. 
Hello. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, so it did exist. The idea of making it simplistic and making it put into a, a nice way in a book form that's Euclid. And Aeon, uh, the mathematician, uh, it was algebra. She clarified it. And then, of course, it went into the, the Arabic world and it comes back to us. But he's part of that. I think that's interesting. Another thing that's important about it, and of course, she's connected to the museum. Yeah. So it is part of this train of thought. Uh, well, now I have to see Agora. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's good. And the other, the other one is there's a whole bunch of Neo Pythagoreans that are connected to the uh, Library of Al uh, Alexandria. And a lot of them have are fem or women, females who are part of that. And people don't know that either. Uh, one time I put together a long list of their names. And people are going, I've never heard of any of them. Again, erased. Yeah. You know, but talked about. But, uh, for some reason, because Pythagoras and his wife and their daughters were all uh, uh, into the philosophy, it became traditional for women as well as men to be part of that perspective. It's just Alexandria was so open to different perspectives. A lot of them ended up there and studying at the museum. And we have some of their writings. I even have a work <laughs> by the daughter of Pythagoras on, 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 on a breastfeeding the Pythagorean way. <laughs> you just can't make this up. <laughs> Yeah. So, again, probably a list of works you probably don't want to read, but you know, but these are the kinds of works that do survive. And a lot of uh, uh, Asia was into Neoplatonism, uh, works of Hermas Trismegistus, and we, we I can even put together our, her whole system of thought based upon not only uh, not only uh, Theon, but thank you, Sneethius. That's a hint. Read Sneethius, his letters. And you can parse out her whole philosophy by by looking at the replies that he makes to her. I did that for a talk. I'm going, I'm going to take Sneetheus and we're going to put together Hypatia based upon somebody who knew her. And I did that. For, maybe that's a good presentation for me to do sometime here. If you guys yeah. are interested in that, I can do Hypatia. Yeah. And yeah. I can talk about, would you guys be interested? We maybe did a Hypatia um, once, but yeah, I don't remember if that we talked about that. Yeah, so we could do, if you guys are interested in something great. like that, that would be, That'd yeah. Be great. Yeah, so that way you can actually get to know her from people who knew her. And I and think that's, that's kind of cool. And so you'll like the movie. Uh, Carl Sagan talks about her a lot too. Who? Uh, Carl Sagan talks about her a yes. lot as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, but she's definitely a worthy uh, person to, to study. But uh, and, and a lot of her beliefs are extremely mysterious. Uh, she is sort of a monotheist, polytheist. That's a whole another interesting bit too. Uh, she believes in uh, the the monad or the one that emanates and becomes the the, uh, the pleroma and becomes a multitude. So so that's why she was so acceptable to many Christian groups because she's almost a, a pagan like monotheist, uh, sort of. Monotheist, you know, uh, but again, she was she's very much steeped in that uh, perspective. Yeah, you can answer your question. Uh, any other questions? That was a good one. I had a question. You kept mentioning something that sounded like you said Golden House. Is that yeah, right? Go the Golden House of the Abbasids. With Golden. Uh, so what happened is is that uh, during the <clears throat> the Abbasids uh, in Babylon wanted to collect all the knowledge of the world and put it into this great library mm -hmm. and being inspired by, guess what? <laughs> uh, and they collected as much as they could from all around. Uh, and, and this was a very important place. Uh, and then there were other libraries in, in, uh, in, in what would be Baghdad uh, later on. And then unfortunately uh, you have the, the Mongols destroying this in the 1200s. Now Abbasine, I'm not sure. Abbasids, A, B, B A S S I D S, I think. I'm trying to think of the one or one yes, right? Uh, about okay. CTL. I'll look that about up. About CTL. Would you a, be a, a B B A S I T S L? Okay. They're um, after the Umiyads. The what? I'm sorry. Umiyads. How do you say? Okay, so U M A Y. Sometimes another Y. Sometimes not A B. Okay. Yes. I'll look that up. And yeah. they're based in Damascus. Okay. And the other will become Baghdad. Yeah. 
I don't think we've done much talk on Damascus, their ancient culture. Yeah, uh, Damascus, well, yeah, I mean, the, the Umayyads are pretty interesting, but yeah, they're interesting. They're, they, what they do, interesting about the Umayyads uh, in Damascus, Damascus, which was the capital, uh, it, it had the largest uh, in ratio. Uh, it was still a mostly Christian, even though it's Muslim, mostly Christian uh, empire. Uh, uh, there, there are more Christians there than Muslims all the way until the, uh, to the 1100s. Just throwing that one for free. It seems like the Crusades ruined everything. Would you be interested in talking about that in the future? Yeah, yeah. You're figuring this out right now. Would you be interested in talking about that in the future or are you going to be too busy to write new talks? I don't know. Maybe something. I, I've done the Crusades, so, but, um. I don't know. We'll think about it. Would you then want to, for September 9, reprise the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World? I could do that. That sounds interesting to people. That was a very popular one. Sure. Oh, yeah, that's fun. It's another fun one. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. If someone likes that idea, I'll do that one for September. So Hypatia and this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just sort of a, like uh, since we're in that area of the world, continue. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. Cool. Oh yeah. So, any other questions? Good stuff. Everybody's brain's going. All right. Stop. Stop. <laughs> you need to stop. <laughs> All right. Well, then I'm going to close it off. Uh, thank you so much for coming, and I thank hope you enjoyed uh, this evening. And uh, hope to see you again. Thank you. Yeah. Night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you